Dear speakers, dear participants, welcome to this webinar. I'm Irena Gidikova, Head of Inclusion and Anti-Discrimination Programs at the Council of Europe. And I'm honored to guide you through this event, organized in the context of the Include EU project funded by the European Commission, in partnership with the Intercultural Regions Network, the Assembly of European Regions, and the Council of Europe and IOM. And we have a panel of distinguished speakers with us today. Connie Bramberg, who is co-chair of the Intercultural Regions Network and Regional Minister of Culture at Westergötland in Sweden. Angeliki Petritis, Policy Officer at the Director General of Migration and Home Affairs, the European Commission. Job Sköller, Senior Integration and Migrant Training Specialist at the International Organization for Migration. Arantxa Garcia Fesneda from the Secretariat for Equality, Migration and Citizenship of the Government of Catalonia. Josie Roquefort, Member of the Association IAMIS, uh, again in Catalonia. Elena Tubertini, Tutor and Team Coordinator for the Mentorship Project at the University of Padua. Welcome to you all. Before we start, please follow the, fo uh, the rules of webinars, which are you know, quite classic. All participants should keep their microphones on mute at all times. You will be able to ask questions, and to do so, please um, write them in the chat and specify for whom the question is, please. We will collect the questions and we'll share them with speakers at the end of the webinar. I would like to thank very much the AER team and in particular, Johanna Pacevicius for a fantastic preparatory work for this event. Um, today, we're discussing how the intercultural integration approach can improve the migrants' inclusion and cohesion outcomes in European regions. Um, some of you may know that intercultural integration was born as a policy approach for the local level. That was 12 years ago. And during that time, it has gained wide following and a growing recognition of its effectiveness. Now, sometimes people ask, why is intercultural integration such a paradigm shift in, in the field of integration or integration policies? Well, while human mobility has existed throughout history, and it was always the source of both conflict and wars, but uh, also development and prosperity, integration has been a natural process of mixing interaction and hybridization, and not really the goal for public policies until sometime during the 20th century, when the first integration doctrines were established. and when they were established, traditionally, integration was either conceptualized as assimilation, often leading to rejection and alienation of migrants and their descendants, descendants, although often they did have formal rights and even citizenship, but the rejection was produced, triggered by um, the lack of acknowledgement of their cultural identities. Um, and traditions. Um, other doctrines for integration understood integration process as a purely economic and regulatory process. Um, everyone was allowed to keep their culture and identity, but and it was thought that only the economy and the law hold communities together. Both of these approaches had their positive sides and benefits, but they were also short-sighted in their own way. Since they did not take into account the fact that integration is actually about making people who have very different personal stories, experiences, and identities feel that they belong to the same society, share the same values, and wish to work for the well being of, of their new home, of their new society. And while that process, the, the, these outcomes are not necessarily naturally natural for public policy interventions, they are extremely important. Well, yes, newcomers need specific services and support, but 
one of the most important jobs of integration is at the human and cultural levels, um, at the levels of perception, trust, recognition of the other as um, equally, equally valuable human being. And public policy can facilitate or hamper this process. At the Council of Europe and the Intercultural Cities Network, we have built a massive know-how and many tools to help authorities at the local level in particular to meet that challenge successfully. And of course, the local level is key, but regional authorities have a very important role to play. And this is why the initiative of Catalonia to launch the Intercultural Regions Network under the aegis of the Assembly of European Regions and with the support by the Council of Europe was such an important step. The intercultural approach has three pillars, equality, diversity and interaction. And all of these have a participation dimension and you, you know that participation is the focus of our webinar today. Participation in ensuring equality means empowerment in participation and embracing diversity means active recognition of the other and the diversity advantage. Participation and interaction means building bridges and breaking walls between people. Today, uh, our speakers will illustrate how these principles can be embedded in practice. I hope you will enjoy and will learn. With this, I'd like to give the floor to Connie Bremberg, uh, who is the co-chair of the Intercultural Regions Network. Well, thank you so much, uh, Irina. In uh, 1945, uh, George Orwell wrote The Famous Animal Farm. That book is about farm animals who rebel against their human farmer, hoping to create a new society where the animals can be equal, free, and happy. And there's a well-known statement in the book. All animals are equal, but some are more equal equal than others. The idea and the acceptance of all men being equal is the basic principle when we enter the area of intercultural relations and dialogue. Therefore, we need to raise questions about our shared values. We must ask, are non-Europeans more equal than Europeans? Are old people less equal than young people? Are rich more equal than the poor? Are women less equal than men? The foundation, the basic ground for our way of accepting a new competence, the intercultural competence, is the acceptance of each other as equal partners. As uh, human beings, we have rights, but as uh, organizations, nations, or uh, official partners, we have obligations. And we need a balance between the rights and the balance. The human rights talks about the equality of all men. Within the Council of Europe, a network of intercultural cities have been formed. I represent the regional level and in my capacity as regional minister of culture in West Sweden, and in our uh, mutual organization, Assemblies of European Regions, AER, we've been inspired by the work done among the intercultural cities. And our aim is to develop a strong network also between the various European regions. And today I would like to encourage you all who are participating today in this webinar to contact your local leaders and invite them to the AER Intercultural Regions Network, where I have the privilege to co-chair. We are currently planning for a summer academy that would be contribution to the understanding of intercultural dialogues. And today, it's my great pressure, pr privilege and pleasure to extend a greeting to you all and welcome you to this uh, important webinar about active participation and social inclusion. Welcome to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Connie. Um, we are delighted to have you with us, but of course we will release you if you need to to go to your um, uh, to your assembly meeting. So the the next speaker is Angeliki Petritis, policy officer uh, at the DG Home European Commission, and uh, she will introduce the EU action plan on integration and inclusion and the expert group on the views of migrants. 
Angelique, please. Hello, thank you, Irena. Uh, that was a perfect introduction to our you know, policy about uh, integration. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, so I'm going to present uh, the action plan, the action plan of 2021-2027, which was approved last uh, uh, November. And you will see there are many actions who reflect exactly what, what you said about equality, about involvement of uh, local authorities and of migrants in policy making. So how, uh, next slide please. Um, how we started this action plan, where we're based about the results, the evaluation of the 2016 action plan, uh, where we identified some areas of improvement. And for instance, um, the scope of the action plan uh, is no, not only uh, for uh, migrants, but it's also for um, people, for citizens, EU citizens with a, with a migrant background. So it's much more inclusive than the 2016 action plan. Uh, we want to put more strong, um, a stronger focus on women because we think uh, we found out that women are very disproportionately impacted uh, by uh, access to health, by access to employment and access to education. So we need to put a more a stronger um, a focus on women. And the role of course society in the integration process because uh, integration is a two-way process and migrants should want to integrate but the host society should also be open to accept them. So there is, and we need to work on that. And this links very well with what you've said, Irena, before. So next slide, please. So what are the main principles? Um, of the action plan, so inclusion for all, uh, mainstreaming gender and discrimination and anti-discrimination priorities, and it's also in cooperation with other commission policies uh, against racism, for instance, etc. Uh, we need to put more targeted support where it's really needed. To maximize the EU added value through multi-stakeholder partnerships, it's very important because uh, one, you know, uh, migration is is managed by central government, but it happens locally. So we need to encourage, we need to involve partners uh, from the local authorities, but also from the private sector, from employers. So we need to build these partnerships. They're very important if we want to succeed in integration. And of course, we need to support uh migrants at all stages of the integration process and there are measures for instance also uh pre-departure measures when they're still in the before they, they reach the eu so next slide please so we have identified four uh sectoral areas of action which were also in the 2016 um uh, action plan so education and training um it's very important that education happens from the start. Uh, we have problems, for instance, uh, with children, uh, asylum seekers who are not in school. They are in camps and they lose, you know, uh, in Greece, for instance, half, half of, the, of the children in, um, in the camps are in schools, which is tragic, I find. So teachers should be better equipped to deal with uh, multicultural and multilingual classrooms. Qualifications acquired uh, outside of the European Union should be recognized, so to give access to education, to higher education, for instance. And language training is also very important uh, because without language, you, you know, how can you access education? So I will speak about the how later because we don't have more time. So can you have the next slide, please? So employment is the next area. We should um, achieve more, uh, a stronger cooperation between la labor market actors. Migrant entrepreneurs should be encouraged uh, with different, through different uh, means and projects. Migrant women should participate more in the labor market. Um, we should, for instance, uh, provide childcare for migrant women so they can participate. Skills. Migrant skills should be recognized, uh, not only qualifications, you know, formal qualifications, but also skills are so important, you know, for employment. And we should provide uh, vocational high, high, 
high quality vocational education and training to migrants, which is not the case in many countries. There are countries which are more developed, but there are countries which is not. And it has to be uh, done in cooperation, of course, with employers. Next slide, please. Health, another important uh, chapter. How can we achieve that? We want uh, migrants to have the same access to health as EU citizens. Of course, they need, uh, there's a language buyer, they need to have the information in their language, they need to know their rights in their language, they need to have uh, proper interpreting when accessing health. And a specific challenge is uh, faced by women as they need prenatal and postnatal health care. And they need also uh, female interpreters, properly trained female interpreters, who can really support them. So how do we achieve all that? Funding. Funding is a big, of course, issue. Um, but, you know, integration is not, um, it's a national competence. We cannot impose, there's no legislation on integration. So we cannot impose on member states. We cannot encourage them, you know, to, uh, to do the actions, to to be more active in integration. So funding funding is one, of course, uh, is a way of encouraging them, but also um, we have many actions, uh, cooperation with local authorities, um, with central governments, with the different networks. So all these work uh, in order to exchange best practices and support you know, the different actions, uh, the different projects in, in terms of integration. So, um, Housing uh, is the last, uh, the last sector, so this is, this is another big issue. There was uh, last week um, uh, research published by the OECD. Uh, the findings were that um, migrants have to bear a much more important burden from their income in, in housing compared to EU citizens. And this, of course, varies from country to country, but it's, uh, if I remember correctly, 70% in Greece and it's 2% uh, in Estonia, for instance. There are a huge difference, but still it's, it's an important burden. So we need to provide more adequate and affordable housing. Uh, not every country can, um, can provide social housing. It's not developed everywhere, but at least we need to fight discrimination um, on the housing market and support them, mediate with landlords, for instance, in order uh, that uh, migrants can have a, a proper housing because proper housing is so it's the basis. If you if you don't have a how if you don't have a home, how can you have a job? How can you go to education? So they are all so linked. So again, the how is with through funding, through mutual learning, uh, promote models of autonomous housing, etc. So next slide, please. So this is all. All these sectoral um, actions are underpinned by horizontal actions that are cross-sectoral, so uh, nothing new there. Um, I already spoke of that, to build strong partnerships, very important between national authorities, local and regional authorities, host communities, civil society, social and economic partners. Uh, it's, we know why, it's, it's too obvious, I think. I don't want to spend more time. Um, next slide, please. The yes, funding one minute. one minute more, please. Yes, the funding opportunities. Um, not only the, the AMIF fund, but also um, we have the European Social Fund Plus and European um, Regional Development Fund that can help. So digital is also very important, uh, especially in the COVID era, as we know, it's so crucial uh, that there is uh, migrants have digital literacy in order to, uh, to access the different services. Um, Again, um, next slide, please. And this is the, about fostering participation and encounters with the host society. And we want to involve migrants and migrant organizations in all decision-making processes. Uh, next slide, please. So this is why uh, we set up the expert migrant group. Um, this was set up last November. Um, it's not new because it started, uh, the proposal was already in the 2016 action plan that the, the involvement of migrants in the design and implementation of integration policies is crucial. Uh, there was a pilot project in Urban Agenda, which was very successful, and this gave birth to the Migrant Action Group in 2020, and its role is to support the Commission, um, migrants should support the Commission with their knowledge and policies in the area of migration, asylum and integration, 
in a sustainable and transparent manner. And next slide, please. So uh, the Migrant Expert Group has 24 experts. They come from different backgrounds, from different countries. They come from migrant organizations, uh, migrant councils, civil society, academia, business and trade unions. It was a very successful operation. We received 396 applications, so, and, and many of them were very good, so we had uh, a hard time to choose them. And uh, we meet um, three times a year. The first meeting took place in November, and our commissioner, um, Ilva Johansson, met them because she, she wanted to meet them. I mean, it was, I think it was a very good thing. And um, this is where we stand now. And this is not a one-off thing, the migrant exit group. Also, in the call for proposals, the last call for proposal of MAFI, the deadline is today at midday, actually. Uh, there is a topic, topic three is about promoting the participation of migrants in the design and implementation of integration policies. So, thank you very much. I don't think I have more time, but we can do more on the discussion. Yeah, it's about monitoring and next steps, but uh, I don't want to... Thank you so more. much, Angeliki. I understand that the action plan is so rich and it's really, I would say, quite avant-garde, um, also very intercultural. So I understand it takes uh, it takes time to introduce all of its richness. Um, I invite all participants to read it because it is really very, very interesting and instructive and of course to act upon it. Now for everybody, our participants to become active, not just in listening, but also in sharing their opinions. Uh, Joanna will introduce the first poll. You have uh, the questions on the screen. You have a couple of minutes to choose one of the answers. Joanna, I don't know if you need to explain to people how they, they vote or is it self-evident? I think they all just need to click and, and submit. Um, I see okay. that we are getting quite a few answers already so 50 percent of uh, attendees have voted so for those of you who have not yet cast their vote be courageous and nobody will know what you have voted and just click and submit so i'm going to close the poll so we can see the results What is the main barrier to civic participation in your region? Opportunities for participation may not be well known. That's the vote. That's the answer that won 47 percent. Well, it sounds relatively easy in a way to work on this barrier because it's a matter of information. But then, of course, access, outreach and quality of information and the channels of this information are important to remove the barriers. Thank you very much for the vote. And let's now give the floor to Jobst Höller, who is the Senior Integration and Migrant Training Specialist at IOM. Jobst, please, you have the floor. So here we go. Um, but when we talk about participation, as already indicated, actually, uh, in the opening remarks, there are often sort of different perspectives. One is sort of a bit more vertical, looking at some of the inequalities that exist vertically, particularly in relation to uh, the interaction of the migrant with the public realm, uh, with institutions. Uh, so the, the emphasis particularly on involving migrants in, in decision-making uh, that, that affect them. In this presentation, I will focus more on the horizontal uh, uh, line, uh, which is often captured under this uh, sort of kind of trendy term of building social bridges. Um, which particularly leads to uh, a better understanding of the other group and uh, trust and appreciation of some of the differences. So um, the focus in terms of barriers, and it's not an exhaustive actually categorization of the different barriers that exist, but just some indications, is focusing more on, on the social bridging uh, aspect. Next slide, please. Uh, um, in terms of how IOM sort of approaches this, uh, 
as you know, we, we are not just a, a development agency. We very strongly present in the humanitarian context. We work across as UN, uh, using a UN term across the humanitarian and uh, peace and development nexus. And within those programming areas, we do include so social bridging activities. They have slightly different names depending on who you would be talking to within IOM. Uh, in the sort of kind of transition recovery program after an emergency crisis, it's often referred to, um, particularly in a peace building context, uh, as, as social cohesion programming, which refers uh, usually to sort of more place based strategies to um, and, and integrating social mixing elements within those strategies to bring communities together. Within on the development side, this is more closer to where I'm working in. <laughs> Is it's more uh, usually discrete activities that are sometimes linked to integration, uh, uh, border integration activities. Uh, I'm covering also pre-arrival uh, uh, support, and and there we also have sort of um, social mixing elements uh, as well. We have a fair amount of internal guidance, but also some guidance that is more externally directed, and some of the publications are listed here. Uh, in the next months, we will be bringing out um, a, a publication that is uh, based on a literature review, also on the review of some of the impact evaluations that we have regarding social cohesion activities that is called Power of Contact. And I would be particularly drawing on this publication uh, highlight when I'm highlighting a few barriers that may exist. And they were nicely actually indicated already in the poll of what they might be. So I go to the next slide. Sorry, next slide, please. Now, geography matters. As already indicated uh, uh, um, in, in the previous uh, presentation, you know, where migrants settle, particularly newcomers, can really structure the opportunities they have to interact. Also, some of the existing uh, stereotypes that might already exist between groups can all sort of frame uh, their perception of, of, of um, host communities or local communities and actually the other way around. So it is quite important to bear this in mind um, that often new arrivals already settle in areas where you have huge structural inequalities that may not just be linked between migrants and non-migrants that may be within the community itself that can also uh, local uh, populations. And that's an important uh, uh, um, factor to bear in mind when we think about um, designing those activities. So before we start designing, we should be really keenly aware and have a good geographic knowledge of uh, a knowledge of the geography in which those uh, activities should take place. Um, let me uh, move on to the next um, so barrier. I'm just sketching them uh, just for the obvious one is simply individual barriers that are often linked to, let's say, to the notion of affordability. Affordability is not just the question of whether you have the money to do it, whether you can uh, the leisure to do it, but also um, whether you can afford it in terms of the time. Uh, time is an important resource factor, particularly for those who work in, 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 in certain professions. So uh, that's obviously an initial starting point, a basic starting point for many of this, these activities. And um, depending on the target group, we should be trying to be inclusive as possible, also bearing in mind of some of the financial barriers that may exist for individuals. Going on to some of the social barriers that may, may exist, um, and here we go to the next slide, there are different, different components of it. Um, I think one is simply, as already indicated, are there actually, in fact, opportunities to, to interact? And that may not equally distribute it across the migrant population. Certain migrant populations, uh, groups can interact quite easily. They may know about it, but in other cases, it might not be there, and you might actually construct it. And I think the idea in terms of uh, when we target, I think the, the idea is really targeting the underserved uh, uh, population groups within local and, and migrant uh, 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 popu populations. So um, the sometimes there are also struggles in terms of actually finding activities that appeal across groups. Some group uh, activities might be very appealing, for instance, to local populations, but might be controversial actually for migrant populations. It might be linked often to gender roles, the appropriateness uh, of participating in, in those activities uh, from, from uh, uh, women versus men. So uh, this is something I think that needs to be taken into account. Of course, also the, the language proficiency can be an important impediment and, and that needs to be factored in also into the design. So there can be a motivational and cultural disconnect sometimes in terms of the activities that are proposed 
and how it's being perceived uh, by the respective uh, communities. So customizing promotion material, we already mentioned that outreach is very important, but it's not just that we have that information, but also how we present it to the risk respective target audiences. So these are just some uh, uh, points to bear in, in, in mind. There may also be this social discomfort, which uh, may not be in the promotional stage, but may come in a little bit when we actually bring groups together, you rather sit together with their own current. And you need to figure out a way of building, uh, first of all, this gradual trust within uh, uh, conducting when you conduct those activities. So there's a gradualist approach that you need to be aware of. Now, looking at some of the, the institutional barriers, um, and again, I'm just sketching and we come to the next slide. Um, of course, already as indicated, you need to get buy-in from many different stakeholders. And, and it needs to start also with um, the, 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 the respective groups, that local leaders, there may be influencers who, who have important, uh, can influence the scope of participation. I think um, building in already in the design phase, participatory elements, consultative elements to figure out, you know, who are the ones that, that um, can have, can influence decisions is, is very important and bringing them on board, uh, particularly though at the, in the formal level is, 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 impo uh, is, 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 is important. Obviously, um, it's also linked to whether there are the strategies at local level in which one can buy in. So that's also important in terms of sanctioning activities and getting buy in uh, across the board. The other part is, of course, who, who's actually doing the facilitation, who's doing the organizing, um, this can also, depending on how um, those organizations might be perceived as being exclusive or being quite dominated by a certain group that are facilitating this, can also influence participation. So these are sort of elements that we um, should take into account. As we go on, we should also be aware that um, it's not an easy task to facilitate those, those interactions. And there can be tricky moments. So there should be a conflict resolution um, um, processes in place, procedures. Also, people for people to opt out. Feedback me mechanisms should be integrated early on, so that we can detect certain tensions that may arise in the interaction early on. Now, um, I start then to the next slide. Um, I will I not. Focus, yeah, one minute. I will not actually focus on this. You can read the publication, it's out there, it's quite well known. Just to highlight, I think some key aspects that are mentioned in those principles is the importance of equality-based interactions to facilitate that we all act on eye to eye, that there are no socioeconomic differences don't matter. That we look at goals that are commonly agreed and that we need to work together as a, as, as a group, sort of an inter, the interdependence to achieve those goals is, is very important. And then we, in the process, appreciate the differences that uh, help to achieve those. So this is just something that are encapsulated in those, in those uh, factors of success. Just in conclusion, I think there's just two points that I want to say, um, we come to the final slide. Um, I think when we, my recommendations were particularly focused a bit more on newcomers. And I think it's quite important that at early stage that newcomers have uh, already positive experience in terms of interaction. So when you think of the integration stage that we should try to involve both communities, local and uh, uh, migrants, early on in the discussions. And that can even happen when migrants are already not there, already, you know, there are many digital means now to, to foster that interaction. And I think uh, it's very important once they have negative experiences and it's an accumulation, it becomes much more difficult to design those activities, trustworthy activities. The other thing is these activities matter. We know those who work on it do matter, but getting the evidence is sometimes quite tricky. And we know that participants who participate often have a positive view on this. But actually, when you think about the scaling, the importance is that the perception of the different groups changes over time. And this is something that can be captured more through uh, uh, interesting impact evaluations. And uh, I saw the impact evaluation slide from the European Union. This is maybe something where more resources might need to be uh, made available because often uh, it's so small scale that the resources are not easily there. And I think this is something, an appeal where we can, it's different organizations, Council of Europe, IOM, can also support uh, uh, that sort of work. So I leave this uh, thoughts with you for further discussions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jobst.
Thank you so many useful tips, uh, very practical uh, and very meaningful. I, uh, I invite everybody to read uh, to read your paper. And indeed, um, I can only agree with you that we have to make sure that the interaction is productive and equal. And um, the intercultural regions that are member of the intercultural regions network will be able through our academies to learn, for instance, what kind of public discourse and strategies can be adopted to break prejudice or how you can co-design together with migrants and refugees your intercultural strategies. And finally, we're actually working now on a new tool, which is data-driven AI-based tool on, um, to measure the impact on social trust of the intercultural policies. It's called uh, Social Trust Barometer. Bear with us, it's not easy. Hopefully, we will have some results soon. Thank you again. The next speaker, we have a couple of speakers from Catalonia that will speak together. Um, so Arancha Garcia Pesneda from the Secretariat of Equality, Migration and Citizenship of the Government of Catalonia and, and Josie Rockefort from Association EMIS. Arancha, can you perhaps provide a quick overview of the activities your department is implementing with migrant communities? And Tell us, how are you listening to their concerns and how are you making sure that their voices are heard? Um, in Immigration Secretary, we have an area who works for the relationships with the um, non-governmental organization of immigration. We offer them training, subsidence and free legal advice. Uh, today, we will explain experience that started four years ago a group of uh, entities who defend the rights of domestic workers ask us to create a working group because they have very difficult to speak with the public administrations. So we create it. Uh, there are different components, different departments of Catalonia governments, patronal, trade unions, and more than 20 uh, non-profit entities that defend the, the rights of domestic workers. Um, they give uh, us a list of very, a very big list of the requirements and we collect all of them in a government agreement and um, our compromise is to to do all of these uh, pe petitions uh, there are for example they ask uh, weekend trainings because there are a lot of people who work during the week they are internals and they, and they can study and study during the week. They ask for more notoriety in our society. So we make TV and radios advertisements. Uh, we offer a legal advice of immigration. We offer a phone number and an email where they contact us and immigration lawyer will ask us all their questions for free. We create a, a web information where we put all the news. And uh, we offer trainings about matches violence prevention. Uh, we offer training about laboral risk prevention, and we are working with the Spanish government to ratify the Convention 189, which will give them a lot of rights. Um, before pandemic, we have a, a different dynamic groups that it has changed. Uh, before, we usually meet every two months. Uh, the leaders of every entity comes and explain us uh, their problems. We called of them, we gave a feedback in the next meetings, we gave them trainings for trainers, uh, all of these uh, stopped and now we create a WhatsApp group to, really, to, uh, to stay very close with them and, and answer all the problems. Now, Josie uh, Rocafort, uh, who is one of the leaders uh, of one of these entities, will explain his experience. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for, for inviting us here in this meeting. IAMIS is a non-profit association. Uh, it was founded more than three years here in Barcelona. Our main task is uh, to act to like an intercultural mediator between Filipinos community, community here in Barcelona, in Catalonia, and um, the research, public research and, and services here in Catalonia, Catalonia and in, in, in Spain. 
in, in Catalonia, there are almost approximately 40,000 Filipinos in the, the, the most them concentrated in Barcelona city and it's surrounded. Uh, Yamis is direct, uh, is close contact with, with the Secretaria de Migración, with the general government of the Generalitat de, de Catalunya. Uh, we are acting as a um, vehicle to reach out uh, the Filipino that might, that, that might um, require support and needs and help. There's, there's many people need help here in, in, in Catalonia. Um, it's a public and official institution struggle to get to the Filipino community. So it's very hermetic and difficult to enter. Uh, this makes more most Filipino worker unaware to the service provided by, by the institution as um, Generalitat de, de Catalunya. Uh, we collaborate with um, this government in matters of languages, courses, environment, prevention of uh, occupational risk and health. Um, we are agree in many issues with the Miss Angeliki presentation. Many of um, uh, the presentation of like uh, uh, the, the barrier, the courses, the integration, we, we have to, to, to work in, in, this, in these issues. Um, we have also have uh, Spanish classes for the women who are not um, familiar for the local languages. We teach to the Filipino in improving their writing and spoken skills to facilitate their chances for uh, finding quality jobs. Uh, together with the entities, we, with, with the Generalitat de Catalunya, we work to the prevention of gender violence, providing information and consultancy for the women who seek help and need support. Make Filipino aware of the rights and who contact in case of need. Uh, contacting the local administration on, uh, or to contact for the, uh, everybody or to report to the authorities in case of violence, violence of aggressions. We also promote the empowerment of the woman in a situation of sexist violence. And we do action to promote direct participation and collective experiences that promote diversity and gender equality. Most of our country, um, women are domestic employees. We find women in vulnerable situation without residence or permit uh, or work permit. So they work without contract worker. They must wait for three years to apply for this permit. And so, so most of the working condition are not the, the, that those established, established by law. Many times the work for, with, with fear the stress of that, and centrally of that, knowing if a contract will be signed, essential for applying for a residence permit. Uh, most of, of this this woman, um, they, they they wait, are are working in in in, in a situation and vulnerability situation. In this case, labor abuse is evident due to the issue of hours, salary, and incorrect treatment by employers. They are afraid to make mistakes. They do not want to bother employers to the, to, so they don't get angry. Some arrive with a contract signed, but conditions and the part of the taxes being paid for the, by the, the employees. In these cases, we advise to report to the breach of contract. They are advised by our lawyer and we provide them administrative and emotional support. Often they underestimate themselves, the fear of being alone, and without the full knowledge for their they rights, uh, misinformation and the main obstacle to know their real labor situation. This is one of the issue that we address. We explain the existence of the public def defender that the law the same for everyone and languages is, is not the problem for she want to, to, to denounce the, the, the situation. Uh, two of um, the staff of YAMIS uh, were um, the interpreter 
in, in, in Catalonia, in the Spanish government. So we can accompany, uh, we, we can help uh, support this, these people, these um, employees. This is what, yes. what we, this is what we, we are doing here in, in, in Barcelona. Thank you very much, Josie. Indeed, uh, you, uh, you reminded us how invaluable the work of civil society organization is, especially if it's in partnership with the, of course, with the public authorities. And Anja, we are running late, so maybe just a couple of words about the way the pandemic has influenced your work and, uh, and how you have adapted in these circumstances. Well, we changed our our um, communications with them. Uh, we we ha we have now they have our phone numbers. Before we have more separate from them. We have a chat with uh, in the WhatsApp, and we change all, all the priorities. And uh, we have ability uh, free EPs for these uh, workers. Because normally they are illegal, they are no, no administration. Um, they have their situation is not regular, and uh, we offer um, all the news of healthy in different language. We send by WhatsApp, by audios. And we try to be more proxim, no proxim, than to them. Yes, indeed. Uh, the, bar uh, the pandemic has created a lot of new barriers, physical, some of them, but also mental. But also, I, I have found many, many local authorities, in particular, and associations, have been extremely creative in creating, in in, in making new channels for communication or for uh, for exchanges. So, kudos to you. Um, it's time for an, our second poll. Johanna will launch it just now, and thank you very much. In the meantime, uh, thank you, Aranja and Josie, for your input. How do you, in your region, improve the civic participation and inclusion of migrants? Please vote. We have a couple of minutes. You can vote, uh, you can choose more than one option. You can actually choose them all. Fifty percent of attendees have already voted. If you can cast your vote and submit, then we can close the poll. Let's see the results, Yana. Multi-stakeholder cooperation and co-creation of activities. Well, that's the magic word. Multi-stakeholder and multi-level policies as well. And co-creation. Um, our speakers, I'm sure, have a lot more to say about how to manage that co-creation and, and how to make it really work. Uh, maybe our last speaker, for today, Elena Tubertini from the Mentorship Project at the University of Padua will give us some examples of how mentorship in particular can lead to co-creation of activities. Elena, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for introducing me. I'm happy to be here. And thank you to the other speakers, because uh, yeah, everything was so inspiring and uh, well, wow. um, so I hope to fit uh, in all this uh, project that you presented. I am a student of the Master in Community Psychology and the Social Change and Promotion of Wellbeing uh, in the University of Padova. Padova uh, is a city in Northern Italy and it is indeed a really intercultural uh, city. We, host a lot of uh, international students, for example. Um, so today uh, I'm going to present what we did with the mentorship project as a, a mentor, a tutor and a team coordinator. The mentorship project uh, is a project in collaboration with the 
uh, uh, IOM, and its aim is to encourage the interest towards the problems uh, of students with uh, international provenance, and uh, in order to create a network between Italian universities involved and shared best practices, and develop together institutional strategies, and last but not least, of course, promote inclusion and interculture uh, and better environments, uh, inclusive environments in the universities. Uh, so this is our team. We're only with six. Um, and as it was the first year uh, that the project was in implemented in Padova University, uh, we had to start and we asked ourselves, uh, how can we start? Uh, and our answer was, let's ask them, let's ask our target students. Uh, so we decided to start with two activities, a survey to assess the student needs and design a plan to involve them and a plan of activities that could be more engaged, uh, um, where they could engage as more as possible and to better include them in the area. And then we did two focus groups, always on Zoom, of course, um, following the questionnaire track. And what we got uh, from this, uh, let's call it research, this is small research, uh, is detailed information on students' difficulties. We could identify the prior priorities of our action, and we gathered uh, activities, suggestions, and proposals directly from uh, the target students. So uh, what we're doing now with these results is designing new policies uh, with the offices of the university, to promote inclusive and intercultural environments. So now I'm gonna go real quick through the sections of the questionnaire, and I hope it will be interesting for, for you uh, to see what the main areas investigated are. Uh, we chose as a target students with an international provenance enrolled from the second year onwards uh, in the bachelor or master uh, degrees. This choice was made only because um, in the University of Padova, there's already a lot of support for the newcomers, but then uh, they are uh, less and less followed um, in the following years. So we decided to focus on them. Uh, so as you can see, they're really young people and they've been living in Italy from one year up to more or less three years. Uh, and most of them uh, are also planning on having a job in Italy afterwards and keep studying in Italy. Um, and the country of origin is really various. We have a lot of uh, Indian students, Moldavian and Romanian. Uh, so we asked them, where do you face uh, language related problems? Because language is still in Italy the most uh, big, the biggest obstacle for them. And they answered post office, police station and bank. Uh, are the main uh, problems and also renewing the residence permit. We noticed that more than 50% of the students had problems uh, in, in renewing this, which is actually not uh, so encouraging. Also for the medical, uh, the medical, the health uh, issues, uh, we found that we need to enhance communication between doctors and specialists because a lot of students don't uh, have uh, a general practitioner or if they do, uh, they have problems in communicating with them. And we're talking about students that are in Italy for two years, three years. So it's pretty weird that they don't need uh, healthcare support. Uh, so this should be implemented. Um, regarding job search, they Almost all of them showed that they want to know more about work opportunities. Uh, so we are working uh, in order to give them some webinars, uh, also on like how to lead interviews and how to get a job uh, in Italy. Uh, about housing, uh, we found that a lot of them encountered a loss of discrimination in looking for accommodation. So again, uh, language, of course, and also some scam problems. Language, uh, as I said before, is still the main obstacle. A lot of students learn Italian, but mainly online with private courses, books, uh, social networks, uh, 
and well some of them use the language courses of the university but there's still a big split between students that consider themselves fluent enough in Italian and students that say no I I really can't uh, with this level of Italian in my everyday life um, so but they want to be more included uh, that's really important and they wish to know more about events about surroundings about what's going on uh, but it seems that there's a lack of information so also uh, about the poll that we saw before like maybe the information is there but they can't find it uh, or or maybe that it's there but it's not in English again so it's in Italian so they have to use Google Translate uh, so we're also trying to to change this and uh, at the end, yeah at the end we asked them about how included they feel in the community and uh, we also asked them uh, what aspects would you like to change uh, and again language simpler administrative procedures uh, diminish discrimination in housing search and job search and they asked for more social activities and to include italians in their social life because as expected they mostly interact with international students themselves uh, and not with Italians, and they would like, uh, yeah, to interact more with the territory. And last but not least, COVID pandemic, of course, um, had an impact on them. A lot of international students uh, were for like many months or one year abroad and far away from their families, uh, and so they suffered a lot from psychological and social difficulties. Um, so we are trying to change this by implementing the psychological service in English for the university and uh, by uh, doing some social online fun activities with them uh, in order to, yeah, to create some bounds even online. So I hope this was interesting and thank you again. And if you want to know more, these are social networks. Thank you. Grazie, Elena. Uh, you have thank followed you. Uh, Jobst advice to study your target group very well, to know their needs. And I imagine that in the spirit, in the cultural spirit of bidirectionality, you could probably apply the same. I mean, probably the same difficulties are experienced by the Italian students as well, apart from the language, I guess. Um, and in fact, you could imagine that some of the newcomers or foreign students have some solutions and not only needs. So I guess in your mentoring project, you will be also looking or have been looking for solutions offered also by the newcomers and not just for their needs. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Yeah. We have one question in the group in the in the chat let me know or you just jump in and answer if you have the answer how do you work with immigrants that can not read and write so the literacy challenge i think the action plan of uh, dg home uh, integration and inclusion mentioned something about literacy activities yes angelic Yes, indeed. Uh, literacy is very important and um, we should adapt uh, the language courses. You cannot give the same language course to somebody who is illiterate in its own language. So it's also part, um, it's part of the training of the teachers, how to deal with these issues. Uh, but we need, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, it's a bigger challenge than if you are, you know, uh, you have, um, you can read and write in your own language. And, and these migrants should receive support for that, for all access to, to education, but also to, to health, to employment, to vocational training. Um, and this, uh, there, there are projects, there are, yeah, there are, we encourage, of course, uh, measures. That I don't think, I mean, statistically, uh, the number is not, that high, the ones who are completely illiterate. Um, and to link it to women, because there are more women than men also. That's uh, another another reason why women need uh, special support and focus, should, should not let down. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I was speaking recently to the integration official, um, key integration official in Cyprus, and he was said, saying that now they are setting up a, a proper school 
that there are migrants who are at very low levels of literacy and they need to be schooled. And of course, the education systems we have are not meant for adults in particular. So we have to find solutions. And again, you know, in co-design with the community and volunteering, you can probably find solutions, but they of course have to be very high quality. You cannot just imagine the volunteers will just <laughs> happen to know how to make foreign adults literate, but just like this. Uh, there's another question for Angeliki, and I will finish there because we are running out of time. When it comes to active participation and access to health, the number of undocumented migrants is still an issue. Therefore, what are the main actions taken by the European Commission in regard with COVID-19 vaccine and undocumented migrants? Well, um, as I said before, uh, integration uh, is a national competence. So the Commission cannot impose member states, of course, to uh, do, you know, implement policies for, for um, undocumented migrants. But on the other hand, of course, we encourage, because we don't think there should be a discrimination uh, between documented and undocumented, especially in, in terms of access to health. Health should be for everybody. I mean, uh, we don't look at your documents. Um, of course, it is a challenge because in many countries you need uh, to have a social security number and how will you get that if you are undocumented? So you have migrants who will not go to health services even if they need. So there, there have been projects um, with NGOs, for instance, who help them, um, with uh, some municipalities who have set up uh, health services. I mean, I know in Thessaloniki it has been done. Uh, and they don't look, you know, they, they don't look if the, where the migrants come from. You, anybody can walk in and have uh, health support, for instance. But of course, it depends. It depends on the member state and what is the policy of the member state. And and of course, the municipalities and how free the municipalities are uh, to implement services which are not in line with the national policy. You know. Uh, Absolutely, you're right. We have been working actually with the intercultural cities on that topic. Um, mm -hmm. Not only with European cities, we had also Montreal and um, New York actually with us because they have some very quite far reaching, as you know, the city card, which is almost like an ID card, which was introduced in New York and other American cities. But other like Zurich, for instance, is introducing it too. It's becoming more and more prominent instrument to provide a, a larger scope of services uh, to residents who are undocumented because it is it's a human problem, it's a human rights problem, but it's also a, a public order problem. So you cannot just close your eyes and, and pretend they are not there. You have to deal with it when you're at the local level. And there is a policy brief on the Intercultural Cities web page if you're interested to look up some policy approaches that can help. Would anybody else like to add anything before we close? Any of our speakers, last word? If not, I, I really wish to thank you very much and thank to our participants. Thank again AER for, for organizing this event. Uh, there will be other include EU webinars in June and in September. I believe one of them will be on the topic of education. Just watch this space. Um, the e include EU web website will be launched, uh, launched in summer and anyone will be able to provide good practice to be published via an online form. Finally, uh, I invite all the regional authorities who are here or who are members of AER or, or not members of AER, any regional government in Europe, and here I'm talking about the wider Europe and not just the EU uh, scope, are invited to join the Intercultural Regions Network and you can follow the link provided in the chat or contact the team of the Assembly of European Regions. Thanks again, enjoy the rest of the day and hope to see you again soon, maybe in live. Bye-bye. Hopefully. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.